Hello, sixth graders. It's Mr. Carroll here. So today's lesson is going to be connected to Pericles' funeral oration. This was a common thing in ancient Greece, where all the dead were honored in a single public forum um, for the previous year's campaign. Pericles' funeral oration happens during the early years of the Peloponnesian War, the war against Sparta and its allies. It was during the war's first winter that Athens held this public funeral to honor the soldiers who had died. Afterwards, the families of the dead soldiers gathered to mourn their losses. Pericles, in his speech, talks about the greatness of Athens and reminded the people that they made their government strong. He reminded them that citizens had to obey the rules in their constitution. They accepted certain duties, such as paying taxes and defending the city. They were also awarded certain rights, such as the ability to vote and run for office. In his speech, Pericles emphasized that the democratic way of life is worth protecting. He urged his listeners to have courage to continue fighting. The ideas Pericles expressed are still valued as citizens of democratic countries by citizens of democratic countries today. And this is not an odd thing for us in America. Abraham Lincoln, after the Battle of Gettysburg, also gave a similar oration, the Gettysburg Address. His is not as long as Pericles', but it's the same ideas happening there. I'm going to read to you a simplified version of Pericles' funeral oration now, and I'd like you to follow along. I have no wish to make a long speech on subjects familiar to you all, so I shall say nothing about the warlike deeds by which we acquired our power or the battles in which we or our fathers gallantly resisted our enemies, Greek or foreign. What I want to do is, in the first place, to discuss the spirit in which we faced our trials and also our constitution and the way of life which has made us great. After that, I shall speak in praise of the dead, believing that this kind of speech is not inappropriate to the present occasion, and that this whole assembly of citizens and foreigners may listen to it with advantage. Let me say that our system of government does not co copy the institutions of our neighbors. It is more the case of our being a model to others than our, of our imitating anyone else. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority, but of the whole people. When it is a question of settling private disputes, everyone is equal before the law. When it is a question of putting one person before another in positions of public responsibility, what counts is not a membership of a particular class, but the actual ability which the man possesses. No one so long as he has it in him to be of service to the state, is kept in political obscurity because of poverty. And just as our political life is free and open, so is our day-to-day -day life in our relations with each other. We do not get into a state with our next-door neighbors if he enjoys himself in his own way, nor do we give him the kind of black looks which, through, though they do no real harm, still do hurt people's feelings. We are free and tolerant in our private lives, but in public affairs, we keep to the law. That this is because it commands our deep respect. We give obedience to those whom we put in a position of authority, and we obey the laws themselves, especially those which are for the protection of the oppressed, and those unwritten laws which it is an acknowledged shame to break. And here is another point. When our work is over, we are in a position to enjoy all kinds of recreation for our spirits. There are various kinds of contests and sacrifice regularly throughout the year. In our own homes, we find a beauty and a good taste which delight us every day and which drive away our cares. Then the greatness of our city brings it about that all the good things from all over the world flow into us so that to us it seems just a natural, as natural to enjoy foreign as our own local products. Our love of what is beautiful does not lead to extravagance. Our love of the things of the mind does not make us soft. 
we regard wealth as something to be properly used rather than as something to boast about. As for poverty, no one need to be ashamed to admit it. The real shame is in not taking practical measures to escape from it. Here, each individual is interested not only in his own affairs, but in the affairs of the state as well. Even those who are mostly occupied with their own business are extremely well informed in general politics. This is a peculiarity of ours. We do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. We Athenians, in our own persons, take our decisions on policy or submit them to proper discussions, for we do not think that there is an incompatibility between words and deeds. The worst thing is to rush into action before the consequences have been properly debated. And this is another point where we differ from other people. We are capable at the same time of taking risks, of estimating them beforehand. Other are brave out of ignorance and when they stop to think they begin to fear but the man who can most truly be accounted brave is he who knows who best knows the meaning of what is sweet in life and of what is terrible and then goes out undeterred to meet what is to come again in question of general good feelings there is not a great contrast between us and most other people we make friends by doing good to others not by receiving good from them this makes our friendship all the more reliable since we want to keep alive the gratitude of those who are in our debt by showing continued goodwill to them. Whereas the feeling of one who owes us something lack the same enthusiasm since he knows that when he repays our kindness it will be more like paying back a debt than giving something spontane spontaneously. We are unique in this. When we do kindnesses to others, we do not do them out of any calculations of profit or loss. We do them without afterthought, relying on our free liberality. Taking everything together, then, I declare that our city is an education to Greece. I declare that in my opinion, each single one of our citizens, in all the manifold aspects of life, is able to show himself the rightful lord and owner of his own person, and do this, moreover, with exceptional grace and exceptional verse, versatility. And to show that this is not, no empty boasting for the present occasion, but real tangible fact, you have only to consider the power which our city possesses and which has been won by these very qualities which I have mentioned. Athens, alone of all the states we know, comes to her testing time in a greatness that surpasses what, has, uh, what was imagined of her. In her case, and in her case alone, no invading enemy is ashamed to, at being defeated, and no subject can complain of being governed by a people unfit for their responsibilities. Mighty indeed are the marks and monuments of our empire which we have left. Future ages will wonder at us as the present age wonders at us now. We do not need the praise of Homer or of anyone else whose words might delight us for the moment, but whose estimation of facts will fall short of what is really true. For our adventure spirit has forced an entry into every seas and into every land, and everywhere we have left behind us everlasting memorials for good done to our friends or suffering inflicted upon our enemies. This, then, is the kind of city for which these men who cannot bear the thought of losing her, nobly fought and nobly died. Perhaps I should say a word or two of the duties of women to those among you who are now widowed. I can say all I have to say in a short word of advice. Your great glory is not to be inferior to what God has made you, and the greatest glory of a woman is to be least talked about by men, whether they are praising you or criticizing you. I have now, as the law demand, said what I had to say. For the time being, our offerings to the dead have been made, and for the future their children will be supported at the public expense by the city until they come of age. This is the crown and prize which she offers, both to the dead and to their children, for the ideals which they have faced. Where the reward of valor, valor are the greatest, there you will find also the best and bravest spirits among the people. And now... 
when you have mourned your de- for your de- dear sons, you must depart. So we can see here in Pericles' speech how he appeals to the Athenians' wish and desire of being seen as the best, and that their form of government, democracy, is the best. And it is because of that that all of the soldiers fight gallantly, and all of the women who stay home have also done great deeds by not being talked about. Thank you for listening to the speech. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave them below.